Shalom Alaikum. My name is Nicholas Mansfield. You're watching my channel Islam vs. Christianity vs. Judaism. Today I'm presenting a short presentation. Might as well be entitled What Your Church Is Not Telling You or Why Is Your Church Lying to You? This concerns a matter of biblical fraud because, believe it or not, the New Testament is a book which has been corrupted. There are people long ago who were editors of the New Testament and they inserted verses where they do not belong their words were nothing short of forgery because they were claiming to be, for instance, in the name of Paul, Shaul of Tarsus, uh, or in the name of an apostle, whether that apostle was named specifically or not. Uh, at any rate, these were nothing short of forgeries. We shall look uh, for an example a biblical forgery, we'll look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14 verses 34 to 35. Let's see if they send the same message from the same author or if they're not the same message, what are we considering? A, a, an author with a split personality? Let's Let's turn to our Bibles, whatever you've got, open it up, it'll read more or less the same. It reads, Let the women keep silent in the churches, for they are not allowed to speak. Instead, they must, as the law says, be in subordination. If they wish to learn something, let them inquire of their own husbands at home, for it is improper for a woman to speak in church. Now, the first thing we note about this passage is that it refers to the law. We assume it must be referring to Torah. Um, you know, this is what Paul always referred to. Now, it is true that the law says women are to be in subordination, but the law also says that there was a prophetess named Miriam, the sister of Aaron and Moses, who certainly did speak before Israel and the entire nation. So, this is rather contrary to the law. Let us see uh, what Paul has to say earlier in 1 Corinthians 11. Verse 5, But any woman who has her head uncovered while praying or prophesying dishonors her head, for it is the same as if she were shaved. Now this specifically says a woman praying or prophesying. Uh, now if a woman is allowed to prophesy as does a man, uh, surely that gives her the same status as a man. Unfortunately, the people who edited our Bibles uh, decided that they could decide what was right and what was wrong, and what suited them at the time, and what did not suit them. Hence we have a mixed message from the New Testament in 1 Corinthians, which claims to be entirely from the Apostle Paul, and scholars are in no doubt that the consistency of this uh, uh, passage in the New Testament, there is no way that it could not be connected to Romans or 2 Corinthians, Galatians, other Pauline works which are acknowledged to be of Paul, yet we find within it teachings that self-contradict and teachings which claim to be in line with Torah 
or the law, whatever that means. Uh, so, how can this be? The only conclusion that I have is that these uh, two verses from 1 Corinthians chapter 14 were in fact a forgery inserted into the work. Now we need to deal with something that is far more important than whatever Paul thought in his day at that time. And this is concerning the lineage of Yeshua ben Miriam, otherwise known as Jesus, son of Mary, and how this is reflected in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke and another Gospel that I wish to introduce to you. I'll give you the introduction from a man uh, you might be familiar with Bart D. Ehrman, his book, Lost Scriptures. Okay, Lost Scriptures, Bart D. Ehrman, the Proto-Gospel of James. This book is sometimes called a Proto-Gospel because it narrates events that took place prior to Jesus' birth, although it includes an account of the birth as well. The ancient manuscripts that preserve the book have different titles, including The Birth of Mary, The Story of the Birth of Saint Mary, Mother of God, and The Birth of Mary, The Revelation of James. Its author claims to be James, usually understood to be Jesus' half-brother, known from the New Testament, e.g. Mark 6, Galatians 1. Here he is assumed to be Joseph's son by a previous marriage. But Ehrman puts Jesus' half-brother half in brackets. Focusing its attention on Jesus' mother, Mary, the book provides legendary accounts of A, her miraculous birth to the wealthy Jew, Joachim, and his mother, Anna, B, her sanctified upbringing in the Jerusalem temple, C, her marriage as a 12-year-old to Joseph, an old widower, miraculously chosen to be her husband, D, her supernatural conception of Jesus through the Spirit, and E, the birth of Jesus in a cave outside Bethlehem. Parts of the book rely heavily on the infancy narratives of Matthew and Luke, but with numerous intriguing expansions, including legendary reports of Joseph's previous marriage and grown sons. Mary's work as a seamstress for the curtain of the temple and the supernatural events that transpired at the birth of Jesus, including a first-hand narrative told by Joseph of how time stood still when the Son of God appeared in the world, see chapter 18. In one of the most striking of its narratives, we are told that an originally unbelieving midwife performed a postpartum inspection of Mary to be assured of her virginity, see chapter 20. Since the book was already known to the Church Father Origen in the early 3rd century and probably uh, to Clement of Alexandria at the end of the 2nd, it must have been in circulation soon after 150 CE. The book was enormously popular in later centuries and played a significant role in pictorial art of the Middle Ages. So here we are introduced to a figure known as Jehoiakim, and he is alleged to be the father of Mary, the mother of Jesus. So, why do we find no mention of him in the New Testament canon? I have a hypothesis regarding this issue, this uh, conjecture runs quite simply. There was a fake genealogy in the book of Matthew in chapter 1 where the New Testament begins. The first chapter you will read is a fake. And this fake purported to be the accurate genealogy 
of the Messiah to represent his number as Gematria through David being 14. But in truth, the number of Yeshua given in Matthew chapter 1 is actually the number 13. If you bother to count the heads of the families, the male line. So, how did this come to be? It could be a case of pious fraud, uh, trying to make things look like they weren't to suit the numerology in the line of David by the name of David. Uh, but what we ended up with was something contradicting uh, your Bible. Uh, so therefore I have put up uh, an accurate representation of Da, da, da. This is how Matthew should have read. So, I'll put that at the start of the video. I should uh, like you to have a good look at it, because it doesn't fit on the screen nicely. But, I will go over that in my succeeding lecture, and the name you work in will be placed where it should be placed, between Jacob and Joseph and Mary and you will see that there is a reason why this genealogy works when it is accurately represented uh, but the authors of the additions to Matthew's writings which became the Greek Gospel of Matthew uh, these were not people who were honest. They were dishonest people. They were out to deceive. They had a message, but their research uh, was not up to the same specification as those who instigated the writings and those who sought to preserve the writings in the first instance and those who received the writings have sent you a corrupted Bible by their own additions and their own uh, whittling down of the writings and sometimes by mistranslation. So Matthew has a genealogy and the canon, the Greek texts the standardized Greek text that the critical scholars have approved is corrupted. Uh, what happens if we turn to the genealogy of Luke? Luke, in the start of his gospel, uh, presents Yeshua as uh, a probable relation to Aaron which was a critical uh, matter for establishing the lineage of the Messiah because he had to be descended from David through Solomon but also a descendant through Aaron's house which meant that he was destined to be uh, potentially both king and priest although he could have been just either one of them if you turn to the Tanakh, you will find the truth there. I'm not, I don't really have time to present all of that right now. And what I will read is uh, this section of Luke and how it should read. Yeshua was legally deemed the son of Joseph, son of Eli, son of Matai, son of Levi, son of Malki, son of Yana, son of Yusuf, son of Mattiah, son of Amotz, son of Nakam, son of Kesli, son of Nagai, son of Makat, son of Mattiah, son of Shimi, son of Yusuf, son of Yuda, son of Yukanan, son of Risha, son of Zerubbabel, son of Shaltiel, son of Neri, son of Malki, son of Adi, son of 
Kosan, son of Almadan, son of Er, son of Yehoshua, son of Eliezer, son of Yoram, son of Matat, son of Levi, son of Simon, son of Yehuda, son of Yusuf, son of Yonam, son of Elakim, son of Mala, son of Mana, son of Matara, son of Nathan, son of King David, son of Yishe, son of Obed, son of Boaz, son of Salmon, son of Nachshon, son of Amenadab, son of Ram, son of Hisron, son of Peretz, son of Yudah, son of Jacob, son of Yitzhak, son of Abraham, son of Terak, son of Naka, son of Sharak, son of Rehu, son of Pelek, son of Eba, son of Shilak, son of Ophaxad, a son of Shem, a son of Noah, son of Lamech, son of Mezusalel, a son of Enoch, son of Yared, son of Mahalel, son of Canaan, son of Enosh, son of Set, son of Adam, created from the dust by Yehovah. Now this reads very slightly differently uh, to the actual canonical reading because there is an erroneous repetition according to the Masoretic and Samaritan Torahs of the name Canaan or Canaan as a later descendant and I have eliminated this from the reading now according to the Septuagint the canonical Al source uh, reads correctly but Gill's exposition of the entire Bible goes so far as to read thus, which was the son of Canaan. This Canaan is not mentioned by Moses in Genesis 11:12, nor has he ever appeared in any Hebrew copy of the Old Testament, nor in the Samaritan version, nor in the Targum, nor is he mentioned by Josephus, nor in 1 Chronicles 1.24 where the genealogy is repeated, nor is it in Bez's most ancient Greek copy of Luke. That's talking about Codex Bezai. It indeed stands in the present copies of the Septuagint, but was not originally there. Therefore could not be taken by Luke from thence, but seems to be owing to some early negligent transcriber of Luke's Gospel, and since put into the Septuagint to give it authority, I say early because it is in many Greek copies and in the Vulgate, Latin, and all the Oriental versions, even in the Syriac, the oldest of them, but ought not to stand, neither in the text nor in any version, for certain it is there never was such a Canaan, the son of Aphaxad, for Selah was his son. And with him the next words should be connected, which was the son of Aphaxad, uh, Genesis 11.12, which was the son of Sem or Shem, Genesis 11.10, which was the son of No or Noah, Genesis 5.32, which was the son of Lamech, etc. So these are the words from Gill's exposition of the entire Bible. And they are saying that, yes, there is an issue with even Luke's genealogy. And what happened was that instead of changing the genealogy of Luke, they altered the Septuagint. And the Septuagint is where a lot of the Greek gospel uh, sources are drawn. They're not necessarily drawn from the Masoretic text. In fact, they're usually altered in line with the Greek reading from the Septuagint. So what the uh, editors did of the early Christian churches is that they altered the Greek Bible. The Greek uh, Septuagint, which was the Greek Old Testament, and they altered it. It's plain to see, and even uh, the biblical uh, scholars from some centuries back acknowledged this. So it's not just me telling you, it's not just me 
saying that the Bible has been corrupted and here are the uh, examples unfortunately there is a general consensus among critical scholars going back from centuries ago till now that yes the Bible has been corrupted and no the Bible of the New Testament has not been changed to correct the old errors and the old additions by unscrupulous editors. So what we are dealing with is a case of biblical fraud and wholesale biblical fraud because it is found throughout the New Testament that people have added things and changed things. I'm not trying to shake anybody's faith in Yeshua as Messiah or the Bible as a whole, but I am trying to bring people back to reality here of where you find a contradiction, then you must reconcile the contradiction with the text. It's not an easy thing to do, and it's not an easy thing to accept that you've been lied to, that your church is lying to you. It's not an easy thing. But these things have come about by tradition, or going back in history, these texts were altered, and then they became an established text in the edited version of what we now know to be a Bible. And this is why you will find many differences in Bibles between the Old and the New Testaments, as they are often called. My follow-up lecture presentation, I will present uh, the full genealogy of Matthew uh, based on the Tanakh and the Gospel sources and will align with what I've outlined here at the start and in the middle so you will get a picture of what was done to distort uh, the writers intentions from the original genealogies and we may move forward from there and get a greater, more truthful picture of how history was actually made. I leave these words with you in our name of our Creator God, Yehovah. Blessed is His name. Blessed is the truth. Let us find the truth because it is the truth that Messiah sent to us. And he charged his people to tell the truth, to present the truth, because it is only the truth that will save us. In the name of Messiah, Amen.